Donnie and Marie Osmond, Under Fire and Gone Coconut, their new movie, which is probably the worst of the five new movies we're going to have on sneak previews today. Two film critics talking about the latest movies. And this is Gene Siskel, the film critic of the Chicago Tribune, CBS Television News in Chicago. And this is Roger Ebert, the Pulitzer Prize winning film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. Now, in addition to Going Coconuts, Roger and I will be reviewing some serious movies. And compared to that Donnie and Marie picture, I guess anything seems serious, even Richard Burton's rotten new movie. We'll also be reviewing Melina Mercury in a modern Greek tragedy, A Dream of Passion. Also, John Avildsen has a new film that is just as sentimental as his Academy Award-winning picture, Rocky. The new one's called Slow Dancing in the Big City. And we'll also review one of the best films of the year, Claude Chabrol's Violette, a drama about a child poisoning her parents. But first, Roger begins with, to my mind, an awful, awful film, <laughs> Richard Burton in The Wild Geese. Giving away my secrets, Gene. Yep. As a matter of fact, excuse me for saying Going Coconuts was the worst movie on this program. I almost forgot about The Wild Geese, which is an embarrassment to both the acting profession and the great tradition of the action film. The Wild Geese is a would-be thriller about a mercenary soldier who recruits a small army and parachutes into Africa to rescue a kidnapped black politician. Now, Richard Burton is the mercenary, and I think in this case, mercenary is the right word because it's pretty obvious Burton only did this picture for the money. Here he is leading his troops into a compound where the African politician is being held prisoner. Hello. Sit still right where you are. Don't move. No sudden noise. We'd like those keys, you see. So whoever has them, just hand them over. Miss Procida, search his fellow first. Drive the cube. I'll take the outside. Barney, I'm Faulkner. Just lie there. Come on, Peter. Quickly. Great band of mercenary senior citizens there. You might have noticed it was kind of hard to cast this movie. It's not easy finding 50 guys who look so much out of condition they can be led into battle by Richard Burton. <laughs> anyway, Burton has brought along two old sidekicks for the caper, Roger Moore and Richard Harris, and they all get together for an emergency session at the airport after they discover they've been double-crossed and there's not going to be any airplane for their getaway. How do we get out of here? Where do we go? Within the hour, we're going to have the whole of them off his bloody army down us like a ton of bricks. What do you suggest we do? Surrender? Me surrender? You must be joking. Raper, we've got ten minutes. You're the planner. Alan, I've got something to say to you. I'll give it to you emotionally first, and then... Rationally, if I have to. This man, um, Madison? Right. Well, he gave us the biggest double cross of all time. Now, my feeling is to give it back to him. Yes, me too, but that's for some other time. Ah, no, 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 it's for now. We came to get Limbani. We've got him. I say we use him. 
We show him to his tribesmen. They think he's been reincarnated. They're about ready for a civil war anyway. Maybe we can start it. God knows, maybe we can even win it. Halt. Right there. Now, you listen to me, Rafer. I've got 50 good men down there, and their lives are my responsibility. I'm not on any bloody crusade. I don't want to do battle with you, Rafer, at least not now. So just get on with him. Get us out of here. All right. All right. Then I'll give it to you rationally. The North is out of the question. Why? What if we got hold of the, the ferry to Burundi? I wouldn't cross that lake in a destroyer. In Dorpus Plains would pick us up like ducks. They wouldn't let us into Burundi anyway, nor Rwanda. Zambia's too far, and uh, east, 600 miles of jungle, totally impossible. Well, that still leaves the south. Exactly. South. Limbani country. Now, I know it well. There's a dried river there and an old stone bridge. If we cross that bridge, we're on our way to Kalima. Well, what's in Kalima? Limbani was born there. I think I can work, Alan. Oh, for God's sake, it's the one chance we have of accomplishing something from this whole mess. I love that old poi, you know, listen, chaps, I know this old bridge, it has a river underneath it, water used to run under it at one time. This is really a dumb movie. It's hard to really start out by saying what's worse about The Wild Geese is an action movie. It's completely unbelievable. As a statement on African politics, it's beneath contempt. They cheapen every idea they discuss. Stay away from this movie. It also cheapens the idea of the great British actor. You know, ever since we're kids, we're raised with this notion that British actors only do plays and movies for the art's sake, never for money. Well, here they're just as cheap as American actors, just as crass. Especially Burton. I mean, yeah. who has made worse pictures in the last five years? If you think of The Exodus Part Two, The Medusa Touch. Hammersmith is out. Yeah. X, X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Exorcist Part Two. you already mentioned that. I mentioned that. that. Blackbeard. I mean... Assassination of Trotsky. He's got a really wretched record. It's time for him to turn it around. Just terrible. Right. Well, now we come on to something a little bit more serious. Uh, our next film is inspired by the Greek tragedy of Medea, who killed her own children as a way of punishing her husband for having an affair with another woman. The movie stars Melina Mercury, playing a famous Greek actress, rehearsing the part of Medea for a performance in Greece. Now, in the middle of rehearsals, she tells her cast the story of a real-life Medea she's heard about. Edward? Yes? A few years ago, there was an American family living near here, a place called Glyfada. Uh, Roy and Brenda Collins, uh, he came from the States, were here, one of those big American companies. Three children. He fell in love with a Greek woman. She became his mistress. The wife found out. Hold your breath. She killed the three children. Front page for many, many days. They called her the Medea of Glyfada. She tried to commit suicide. She lived. She's in the prison here. And Margaret has arranged for me to meet her. Ellen Burstyn plays that real-life Medea she's talking about, and Melina Mercury spends a lot of time visiting her in jail. She learns that Burstyn is a Bible-reading fanatic who thought it was her divine obligation to punish her husband by murdering their children. I begged him, Roy, don't destroy this house. The adulterer destroys his own soul. You can read it in the Bible. He said, you and your Bible. So I hit him. Then he beat me up. And while he was beating me, hurting me, I said, Roy, the words of God are pure, purified seven times. He said, don't you ever raise a hand to me again. One night he was dressing to go out, and I asked him, where are you going? He said, ask me no questions, I'll tell you no lies. I told him I was going to kill myself. So he walks over to me and he says, if it's okay with your God, it's okay with me. That drove me crazy. He wanted me to die. To die and leave my children to a stepmother. A whore. That's when it came into my head. Then every time I went in the kitchen, I stared at that long knife. Then I saw on the calendar that the next Sunday was Father's Day. I said, that's the day to make him his gift. I took a crucifix and pressed it to my breast. And I prayed, oh God, make me strong. Oh God, save my children from the lions. I have mixed feelings about this movie. It is extremely well acted by both Melina Mercury and by Ellen Burstyn, as we saw there. But I think the film has a lot less to say than meets the eye. Compared with the classic Medea of Greek tragedy, Ellen Burstyn's characters comes off as just another Bible-quoting nutcase. 
She is a trivial Medea, and Melina Mercury doesn't grow as an actress or as a person from the experience of meeting her. I agree, Gene. And you know, this idea for a movie is not especially original. I mean, taking something from Greek or Roman tragedy or Shakespeare and plugging it into a modern situation, I think the very least thing we expect is that the star or the character, the leading character in the contemporary drama will learn something from the other person, change in some way. I don't see that here. Yes, it plays like just two movies stuck together. We see some Mercury and we see some Burstyn. It's almost as if they said, well, let's see, Melina, Melina Mercury. She's an actress. She's Greek. Great. Let's put it together. We've got a movie. We also get a lot of backstage stuff about Melina Mercury telling us what it's like to be a great actress. And really, that's all hackneyed backstage gossipy and backbiting and stuff. a little bit overacted, too, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Little acting could have been used in the next film. <laughs> Donnie and Marie Osmond are two of the most popular people on television, Barbie and Ken with a disco beat. <laughs> and now they've made a movie of their very own. It's called Go on Coconuts, and it's all about how Donnie and Marie fly to Hawaii for a concert. And gosh, they get all involved <laughs> in this mysterious plot that involves a stolen necklace and buried treasure and getting chased all around Honolulu by cars and boats and even on motorcycles. Slow it down, little sis. I want to see it all. Donnie and Marie Osmond. Hi. Hi. They're smiling like they're running for office. <laughs> Going Coconuts is full of those kinds of chases and confusions and even singing. Look, for example, at this production number. It looks like Donnie and Marie got trapped in a pineapple commercial. <laughs> Aren't they cute, so to speak? I really <laughs> loved his little hat there. He looks like a banana farmer. <laughs> Donnie smiles all the time, and there are lots of jokes about his great teeth. Marie doesn't get to smile as much because, like always, they make her play a killjoy who's always trying to spoil Donnie's fun. <laughs> the movie's a gooey mess of dumb jokes and bad editing and worse direction. Then there were all those commercials. Gene, I counted nine mentions for Western Airlines, mm -hmm. six times for the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. <laughs> the only thing they didn't get around to plug in were the coconuts. Yeah, I didn't like it, too, and I don't know why she can't get equal time and have somebody... Why get... didn't she get a boyfriend? Exactly. Right. Uh, I suppose some people who are big Donnie and Marie fans want to know whether they should go see it 
even though we didn't like it. What do you say to that? I would say no, because if they liked the television show, this movie doesn't have the production values, it doesn't have the wit, it's not as much fun. Yeah. There must have been a better script in Hollywood than this one for sure, the first movie. Sure, and we expect movie. more from uh, a movie where you're paying three, three fifty to go see a picture. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, add up to the TV show. Well, now we move on to something quite better. If the story of the new movie Slow Dancing in the Big City strikes you as similar to that of Rocky, you won't be far off the track. It was directed by the same man, John Avelson. Paul Sorvino plays a tough on the outside, nice on the inside, New York newspaper columnist who is popular enough professionally, but in his heart, he's lonely. He lucks out when he meets a new neighbor, an uptight ballet dancer played by Ann Ditchburn. Her private life is in a shambles, too. And on the roof of their apartment building one night, Paul Sorvino finds her completely absorbed in her dancing. Are you okay? What's wrong? Nothing. It's just a cramp. There, it's gone. You sure? Yes. I'm fine. You never stop, do you? You dance all day, dance all night. You're like a mayfly, you know that? A mayfly? Yeah. They're born when the sun comes up. They spread their wings by noon. They spend the rest of the day giving it everything they got. And by midnight, they're a memory. They pack a whole lifetime into a few hours, so when they go out, they got no regrets. But I guess when you love something the way you do, you just got to keep going till you drop. It must be a wonderful feeling. Yes, it is. I think I've heard that Mayfly number before. It's an old-fashioned romantic movie, and that cramp in her leg turns out to be quite serious, as slow dancing, like Rocky, becomes the story of one person battling to save herself. Now, when Ann Ditchburn's big test comes on opening night of the ballet, Paul Sorvino is late, arriving. She's worried he won't show. Doesn't he love her anymore? And so with pain in her legs and pain in her heart, it's up to the dancer to save herself, and she'll have to do it alone unless Paul Sorvino arrives in time. Please. Don't worry. Just keep it concentrated. Did you call him? I thought you said you called him. Didn't you think you called him? Yes, sweetheart. Well, you'll be here any minute. Sarah, take your place. Get ready for your entrance. You'll be here. You will. You will. Oh, be here. Please. 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 Can't go up there. I'm Luke Greenland. Oh, yeah, I got your name. Go ahead. Yeah, I know you're late. Where have you been? Didn't I tell you this was important? Uh, yeah, yeah, you told me. Take a taxi like everybody else? Where are you? I got tied up. Oh, where's the little boy? He couldn't make it. Oh. Better get Goose coming up. Oh, God. Do it. Spread your wings. Make yourself proud. In every dance movie, it's just as interesting what's going on off the stage as what's going on on the stage. <laughs> now, we've seen that scene before, and sure, we've seen the 
sentimentality of pictures like Slow Dancing before, but I'd be lying if I didn't say the film got to me, affected me, and made me hope that couple would get together. Sure, there are plenty of cornball moments in Slow Dancing in the big city, but the bottom line is I never stopped rooting for Paul Sorvino to get to that ballet in time. You know what I liked about this movie the most? What? The corniness. Mm. I liked the fact that it was an obvious romantic triangle. I liked the fact, or mel melodrama. I like the fact that they went ahead and tried to develop this stuff without making any apologies for it and make it into super sophisticated New York sort of thing. Well, I think one of the reasons why the corniness might work this time is that at the core of this picture, there are two really good performances, and both characters take themselves very seriously. The one guy's a newspaper man. He's serious about his craft. The dancer, she's dead serious, too. And because they believe it, maybe maybe we believe it, huh? And Paul Sorvino is a very good actor. Mm -hmm. We saw him earlier this fall in Blood Brothers. He's been a character actor for a while. He's ready for these big roles. Yeah, it's a very good film, and I wish people wouldn't be sniping at it. We're getting a lot of people saying this is just oh, this, corny. This movie could be a sitting duck. You and I could make a list here of everything that we think is a cliche we've seen before, and it doesn't make any difference to our enjoyment. And here's another good movie. Our next movie is a chilling French film. It's called Violette. It's inspired by the most famous French murder case of the 1930s. It's the story of a teenage girl who slips out of her home at night to enter the Paris underworld of crime and prostitution. Here she is trying to pick up a customer in a left bank bistro. Je vous dérange Mais non, pas du tout. C'est quoi Le soulier de Satan. Ah oh ouais On a du beurre, là. That was Isabel Huppert as Violette. She won the Best Actress Award at this year's Cannes Film Festival. She plays a deeply disturbed young girl whose sexual obsessions lead her to create two completely separate lives. On the street, she's shocking and bizarre, but at home, she's a quiet, demure young girl. Just sort of nice, quiet family life. That's the other side of Violette, the quiet young daughter. Eventually, her parents begin to see through her lies and deceptions, and then she attempts to poison them, and the movie shows her case becoming a national scandal. They wrote poems about her. They wrote songs about her. To some people, she was a heroine. Claude Chabrol, who directed Violette, is sometimes called France's own Alfred Hitchcock. He specializes in movies about crimes of passion that rip apart respectable middle-class families. And what's fascinating about Violette is the way Chabrol mesmerizes us with the dark side of this seemingly innocent girl. I think mesmerize is the right word. We really watch her every time she's on the screen. And I think 
that criminal behavior is somehow more interesting than normal behavior. Especially in the when it's based on a real case. Yes, and so you watch and you're trying to figure out, now why is she doing this? Why this self-destructive thing? And he gives us all the details. We see the parents. We see every cause of every piece of behavior. Absolutely fascinating. At the same time, we get this lovely deception here going back and forth. There's one good scene in the movie where she has all of her makeup on for being down on the street, and she almost walks into the house forgetting to wash it off. And yeah, I think we sometimes think that uh, a lot of people may have these secret lives, or at least secret thoughts. Here's someone who acts it out. And what's more in this film, by the mm -hmm. fact that uh, Chabrol uses Isabel Huppert, we're fascinated at looking at her, even when she's really seemingly not doing very much, because she's a very interesting face to look at. She was in a film a couple of years ago called The Lace Maker, which is very good. She's only 23. She's an actress to keep an eye on. Yeah, well, and we keep her, our eye on her every time she's on the screen in this film. <laughs> Uh-oh, there's Spot again, and that mongrel in the mezzanine means it's time for Dog of the Week, where we each pick the week's worst movies. Well, Roger, my dog is called Dog. That's right, <laughs> Dogs, a would-be thriller about a bunch of California canines who go berserk one day and start attacking people. Now, you'd never do that, would you, Spot? No, and thank goodness. Dog features all kinds of mongrels jumping around and biting people. Why does the town in this movie become a mailman's nightmare? <laughs> I'd like to tell you, but the movie never explains it. It's just something in the air, something to do with a nearby power plant. Well, you like to see flesh chewed off humans? Well, maybe you need a rabies shot more than you need to see dogs. <laughs> By the way, Dogs is a two-year-old movie being brought back to some cities now with a huge TV ad campaign. So be on the lookout. Don't let the ads for dogs put the bite on you. Put the bite on you, you not badgy. It. Okay, well, my, my uh, dog this week is in the spirit of the season. I'm going to have the turkey of the week, and its name is Message from Space, an imported Japanese space opera sp inspired by Star Wars. Now, it's all about how people from another planet threaten to take over the universe and how the good guys fight back in spaceships after being summoned to battle by now. You gotta get this radioactive nuggets that glow in the dark. Now look at these trashy special effects. Model airplanes heading for a poached egg. But then, what do you expect from a movie where the characters jump out of the way just before a nuclear bomb hits, then they pull out their swords for a real fight? This movie is a message from space, all right. And the message is, send this movie to Mars. Well, what have you got against the Martians? You know? <laughs> so much for the lousiest movies of the week. Now to recap the major films on our show. Both Roger and I thought that The Wild Geese, with Richard Burton as a mercenary, was one of the worst films of the year. That's why there's a no next to both of our names. We didn't like it. We don't recommend you see it. We both have less severe objections to A Dream of Passion with Melina Mercury. Good acting in a confused story. Nevertheless, we give it a no. As for the Osmonds movie debut, well, sorry, Donnie and Marie. We think you need a more mature script, maybe something written by a 10-year-old. <laughs> we give a resounding no to Go and Coconuts. But we both like the sentimental love story, Slow Dancing in the Big City, even with its cornball ending. We do recommend you see it, yes. And finally, Roger and I are in agreement that the French drama Violette is one of the year's best movies with a superior performance by Isabelle Huppert. Okay, that's it for this show. Next on Sneak Previews, We'll show you scenes from The Lord of the Rings, an animated epic fantasy. Ingmar Bergman's Autumn Sonata, starring Liv Ullman and Ingrid Bergman. And Halloween, a heart-stopping American thriller. Until then, we'll see you at the movies. Funding for this program is provided by this station and by other public television stations. Mm.